we're gonna pretend that I'm the judge and you guys are the jury, okay? And now I'm gonna give you instructions. We got a big pile of, of uh, uh, questions and so uh, we wanna get as many as we can in. So, be so brief. can you guess what my instructions are? Keep it brief. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I have a, a question. What is this? It's for you. Yeah, that's for you. <laughs> I want to say the other guys. Well, he's I got him. Oh, they're so slick. They handled that so nicely. <laughs> All right, we'll get started. First question is for Jay, and it's about earthquakes. Can everybody hear me good? Okay. In your research, do you track the increase in earthquakes and how it brings us closer to the end times that the Bible speaks about? Uh, I have not specifically researched it. I've read, you know, a fair amount over the years, and I've heard two conflicting reports. You know, the Bible obviously says things are going to increase, you know, in the latter days, and so I certainly believe that. I've heard some people say, you know, we've had increased earthquakes, and that's proof of that or consistent with Scripture. I've heard other people say, no, we've just been tracking it better and we're reporting it more often. I haven't had a chance to do further research to figure out which of those is true, but I, I would expect those things to increase, but sometimes we just hear about things more often because we're getting better at reporting it. Um, it's more in the news and the Internet and all that, so I don't really know at this point whether they truly have increased in, in frequency and magnitude, or if it's just because we're reporting more, that's something I would have to look into. Okay, thank you. This next one is for Paul McGuire, and it says, where do we start to mobilize authentic Christians to prepare for conflict of truths and to engage our cultural culture, especially our youth? Did you get that? Yes, can you, is this, can you hear me audio-wise? Okay, great. Um, that's a very important question, hugely important question, especially, I believe, for, in the eyes of God. And the, the first thing I would respond by saying, the goal is to be not only strategic, but the goal is to be effective. Now, if you're truly biblical, you're going to be effective. It's a no-brainer. I was listening to my brother here. Uh, talk about that a few minutes ago. If you're, if you're basing your, your plan on the Word of God, it's going to be effective. Mm -hmm. The problem with the church today is basing much of its strategies in evangelism and reaching the youth. It's actually basing it on, this is kind of heavy, the infiltration by the Frankfurt uh, School Marxists that began in, the 19, uh, in 1925 in Germany. Okay, remember those are the Marxist professors that uh, wanted a cultural revolution? Now, many of them are dead, obviously, but the ones that they discipled, the new, the new ranking uh, Marxist professors, they specifically targeted the infiltration of the churches. So, for example, the seeker-friendly movement mm -hmm. was developed by one of the mo most key uh, disciples of the Frankfurt School movement. The, the heads of the seeker-friendly churches went to him on how to design their youth program, their outreach. He happens to be an atheist, a Marxist, and, and, and a Zen Buddhist. Now, why would a Christian pastor go to a Marxist who, uh, group whose goal is the destruction of Christianity and look to him for how to reach youth, et cetera? And this is no small thing. This guy has also written many best-selling books on business management, and they also targeted infiltration of corporate America. Now, here's the thing. This is no small thing, because this methodology of reaching the youth uh, and young people and different generations of people, it is, it is <clears throat> widely accepted and practiced by just about every evangelical denomination, okay? The professors of their seminaries, they teach it, they practice it, and you could talk to, I could talk to literally 200 evangelical, highly respected professors who are teaching on church growth or how to reach the youth, et cetera, and they will give me their plan, which is uh, item by item based on this, uh, the, Fra the Frankfurt School Marxists, 
and how to destroy the Christian church. And they won't even know it. They're not literate enough. They haven't educated themselves enough to know the origination point of the experts they're seeking out. So there has to be an awareness. There has to be an awareness of what the problem is. And then men like my brothers here and others, they are educating God's people, making them aware with the facts, and hopefully out of an awakening, because remember, a great awakening can be very powerful, but a great awakening is both spiritual, biblical, and thinking and intellectual. So the methodology of reaching the youth has to be changed because of the present methodology. Hey, guess what? Are we, are we seeing our kids and grandkids saved? Are we? Look, look at the millennials. They look like they've been reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. No, no, but they can be. I hope I answered the question. Thank you. <laughs> Hello? Okay. I'm still here. Um, why, don't, uh, why don't churches teach Bible prophecy? Anybody that wants to kick in on that, give your... No money in it. And it... Very the, the majority of the modern church, and I fell into this at one point, so I know a little bit about it, is all centered toward how big they can get that church. And that means marketing. And if you're going to market, he used the term millennials, if you're going to market to them, if you're going to try to sell your church and, it, and all of its programs and functions, then you cannot have a message of defeat going out there saying, uh, yeah, we want you to come to church and we want to build this thing, but in five years, the devil's going to tear it all down and it's going to burn the world down, and so what does it matter? So they can't do that. And because there's a lot of, you know, there's division amongst us about what's going to happen, when, and how's it going to happen, and so on, and that's to be expected, but because there's so much division, Pastors don't want to deal with it at all because he may say something and it's all this I don't want to offend anybody he may say something and a group in the pe group of church people in the church not like it all of a sudden They're not supporting they're not coming. They're not tithing. They're not giving and so they can't have that They can't lose the support. So it's not just prophecy It's any of the serious critical issues that are facing churches right now they just don't want to take a stand on it and offend anybody because there goes their money. And that, to me, the, the love of money is still the root of all evil. Can I jump in here? Can I say something on this uh, really quick? Uh, I think understanding the history of prophecy and how prophecy was understood for centuries by the church, especially your reformed Protestant evangelical believers, going back to, let's say, the time of John Wycliffe in the 14th century, then up through uh, John Hus, Jerome of Prague, Martin Luther, William Tyndale, etc. The understanding of prophecy was not what is by and large being taught in churches today. Uh, all the way through the 19th century, the understanding of prophecy that led to the Great Reformation was that the papacy, the papal system, was the fulfillment of the man of sin, mm -hmm. okay? That they were not waiting for the man of sin to show up, the Antichrist. They believed in Matthew chapter 24, where it says, where Jesus says, well, the apostles come to him and they say, Lord, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the age or the end of the world? Mm -hmm. And Jesus says, take heed that no man deceive you. And he says, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, mm -hmm. and shall deceive many. Now, the reformers believed, I first learned this when I was working on our film, A Lamp in the Dark, and we put this in there. Uh, but John Wycliffe believed, as the old Waldenses believed, that when Jesus says, many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, that the many are the popes the line of papal kings, the supposed apostolic line. 
And one after another, they are many, they're not just one person, but many, and they all say the same thing, I am Christ. In other words, the Pope claims he is in, that he has the authority of Christ, that he is another Christ. Um, in fact, the term, the name Vicarius Christi, the Vicar of Christ, mm -hmm. was originally a title that was given to the Holy Ghost in the early centuries. And it, it meant, you know, Jesus says in John, I'm going to go away, I'm gonna ascend into heaven, but then I will send the Holy Ghost and he will, I will not leave you comfortless. So the Holy Ghost was called literally the substitute for Christ. And the Holy Ghost, of course, speaks with the authority of God. So then when the popes rose up and became the bishops of Rome, and then, they, then the old uh, Caesars, you know, in Second Thessalonians where it says, uh, that which hindereth shall continue to hinder until he be taken out of the way. The ancient interpretation of that was that he that hinders is the Caesars of Rome. And that when Caesar is removed, then shall that wicked one be revealed. Okay, the son of perdition, who exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. In the New Testament, the temple of God is repeatedly said to be the church. And so the reformers, the King James translators, the Geneva translators, the Puritans, the pilgrims, all the way up through Charles Haddon Spurgeon, they all believe the same thing, that these things are talking about the Pope or the papacy exalting himself in the midst of the church. And what most believers today don't realize is that the great reformation happened, one, because of recovering the gospel, that we're saved by God's grace through faith, not of works, but it was also the interpretation of prophecy. That it was because Luther and the reformers said, the Pope is the Antichrist. You don't owe him your loyalty. That's what caused all of these countries to break away from Rome and to turn away from the papacy and to have nothing more to do with Rome. And then they believed the Church of Rome was the great harlot of Revelation 17. And so that was the understanding of prophecy from easily the, the 14th century all the way through the 19th and early 20th century. In fact, in the 20th century, I show this in The Lamp in the Dark, you had the great Protestant minister, Dr. Ian Paisley, at the uh, European Parliament mm -hmm. when Pope John Paul II went there to speak mm -hmm. years ago. Dr. Paisley came out and he was there because he was a member of Parliament. And he had his signs that he held up and he was shouting. And he was, he's the first minister of Northern Ireland. He was before he passed away, uh, like the prime minister, you know, the leader of the government there. But he was also a staunch Protestant minister. And he was shouting down the Pope and saying, <laughs> I denounce you as Christ's enemy and antichrist with all your false doctrine. I denounce you. He was actually repeating the words of Archbishop uh, Cranmer who had been burnt at the stake. <laughs> Why? Because he had denounced the Pope as the Antichrist. Yeah. Okay, so I believe this has everything to do with why many churches are not teaching prophecy. Um, there are those who believe that the alternative versions of prophecy were developed to convince the Protestant world that the papacy is not the Antichrist so they could open the door to this ecumenical movement and get evangelicals to go back and join hands with Rome. It worked. Okay. It worked. So yeah. that's that's what I believe. You know, in answer to that question. Can I add a little snippet? You get your mic. Okay. I'd like to add something. Ian Paisley. Uh, to what you just said, um, I, it truly breaks my heart. I mean, um, I'm not really like like a guy who cries in public. Okay. <laughs> I, I just I, I'm not. You know, I'll hold it in. I'm from that generation. You know. I fantasize that I'm John Wayne. Okay, so the thing is this, but I have seen publicly on television very well-known, highly respected evangelical leaders, many of them who, who are household names, a wide spectrum of them. So I've been on some of their television shows. Okay, I'm not just talking about certain charismatic ones that you might be aware of, but that, that would include them, but also the more traditional evangelical leaders, 
some who, who adhere to like a soft Baptist theology. And I must say, it has literally broken my heart to look in their eyes as they speak on television and talk about we're becoming Catholic and boasting of being part of the Catholic Church and, and, pray, and praising the Pope. It, it breaks my heart because the deception and the apostasy is so serious and so deep. And, and how can you embrace the Pope who's a Marxist for crying out loud? And in my opinion, a godless Marxist. I don't even believe he's born again. Right. He's a tool for the New World Order and the United Nations and a Marxist. He's not even saved for crying out loud. And evangelical leaders bowing reverentially and worshiping him and, and, and leading their flocks to do the same thing. You know, I'm very, I was very hesitant to, to go publicly like uh, what, what these gentlemen talk about in, that, in this area. But this is, it, it just rips your heart apart and you, can't, you cannot be silent about it. For a while I was, but I know respected evangelical leaders who are, who are caught up in this slipstream of, it's apostasy and it's deep. And that's all I have to say. Tell us what you really think. Okay. I mean, don't, don't hold back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, guys. I, I do appreciate that. That particular subject is dear to my heart. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here's one. Are you aware of the cartoon character Illuminati? I'm not, but evidently there is one. Are you talking about the cartoon character or the cards, the playing cards? This one says cartoon character. So you're not aware of it either then. The next generation is far more aware of the Illuminati. What are, what are the implications of this? And you guys maybe saw the Super Bowl commercial, the Bell Illuminati. Yeah. Yeah. And my friend said, hey, we're going to go to Taco Bell for lunch today. I said, I'm not going. They thought I was pretty whacked to do that. These are Christian brothers. But I will not. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just can't Can I respond to that? go there. Yep. Okay, so um, I believe very strongly that this is part of a Luciferian mind control uh, uh, effort to use media and music superstars like Beyonce and I could, uh, Katy Perry and, and a huge number of them who are either uh, using Illuminati symbolism, singing about the Illuminati openly, or pray, uh, you know, admitting their witches involved in witchcraft, or follow followers of Aleister Crowley, the great Satanist, uh, in his eyes, the great Satanist, 666. And what this does is two things. It, excuse me for using this term, but, but this is the way younger generations think. It makes being part of the Illuminati getting into Illuminati rituals, which are all antichrist and worshiping Satan, sexy, attractive, the cool thing for young people. So it, it's a, a magnet to bring in uh, young people, and they especially target kids from Christian homes. Notice how many of these female superstars who are using the Illuminati and the witchcraft and the occult, notice what percentage of them and some of the males come from evangelical homes. I talked to Katy Perry's father yeah. on the phone for a long time, and I won't go into the details because there's more there than meets the eye. Uh, because by, 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 by those women and guys rejecting Jesus and the church and going into the Illuminati, that affects all those boys and girls from Christian homes that are kind of confused. Yep. Okay, thank you. And, and I have seen the Illuminati card game. It's very interesting. Yeah. Actually, somebody, I, I heard a, a, a cassette tape in about 1980 all about the Illuminati. And there was a guy, John Todd, you guys have heard of him, I'm mm -hmm. sure. And he exposed it, whether he was right on or not. He exposed it, and I would tell people about it. And it wasn't until about the year 2000 that this went public and then everybody go 
nobody came back and said, hey, you were right after all. Nobody does that. No, yeah, right, right. <laughs> I'm still waiting that for that, yeah. and I think some of these guys are too. <laughs> Chris, uh, the Bible is the inspired word of God. Do you believe the Quran is the, not a, the inspired word of the devil? Well, I would have to say that... Uh, I, in general, I would say yes, because because the the Quran. There's no if you if you study the story of what happened with the Prophet Muhammad, according to Muslims, their own testimony about Muhammad is that Muhammad claimed that he was seeing these visions of an angel. He was being visited by an angel, and the angel uh, would take Muhammad in this cave, and he would be in this cave, and the angel supposedly grabbed Muhammad and choked him, right? And would grab him by the throat and choke him. And Muhammad would be choking and choking and choking. And then right before he passed out, the angel or the spirit uh, would let go of him and say, speak. And then Muhammad would go blah, 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 blah and start rattling off all this stuff. And the people who stood by, his friends and confidants who stood by, they wrote down the things that he blurted out on bone and bits of parchment and leaves and things like that mm. uh, and recorded whatever it was that he said during those episodes. And after he died, after Muhammad died, his followers gathered up all of those writings and assembled them into what became the Quran. But there's no question this spirit uh, was the spirit of Antichrist mm. because he is specifically denouncing the idea that Jesus is the Son of God. Uh, the Quran says, it befitteth not the majesty of Allah that he should take unto himself a son. So they repeatedly deny Islam. I mean, this is one of the core tenets of their belief is to deny the idea that Jesus is the Son of God. Now the scripture says very clearly, who is a liar but he that denies that Jesus is the Christ he is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. So we know that this is the spirit of Antichrist. So we don't really, as Christians, we have the word of God to tell us that uh, the, the message of the Quran is not from God. It is obviously from the bowels of hell. So that would be my short answer. Uh, we're in a farming community. We'll ask this one. Uh, GMOs. What do you say to someone who argues that without GMOs, the world would starve? I'm, in one sense, I'm the least qualified person to answer the question because uh, I grew up with uh, subways and, uh, in Manhattan. Hmm. So I don't know much about farming except I volunteered to bale hay for a girl that I was dating once. That's, that's my, my agricultural <laughs> qualifications. And I did attend a, a university, a University of Missouri, that had big ag agricultural major. But besides that, I know nothing about farming and nothing about even personal gardening. <laughs> so having said that, um, this is a very, very important issue that Christians have to be educated about and quickly because I can't, I can't name the, the company. It's a monster company, but they're so powerful that you can't speak. No. Uh, well, you can say it. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> I'm, I got enough targets on my back. I don't need this one, okay? And I'll tell you why. This company that many of you uh, apparently referenced, okay, they bought, they, they are so wealthy, they bought uh, the, the world's largest, most powerful private military uh, force the world's largest private army, Blackwater, okay? This is, these are the people that the governments of the world, like our government and other governments, hire in. They're, they're like super soldiers, highly trained, but, but when they fight and go in and do, they, they fight dirty because they're not under the umbrella of a government. They're, an in, they're independent military contractors. They're ruth ruthless, they're mercenaries. Now, why does the biggest genetically modified uh, food organism company buy the world's largest, most effective private military? Because they're symbiotic, they're, they're, they're one. 
okay? And they're, they're a death machine. Now, listen carefully, because I've had to deal with some uh, physical challenges, which has forced me to study things for my own survival, because I operate under a principle, okay? The principle is that if I'm, if, if I'm being uh, affected with a physical illness, okay, all right, I, I, I don't just go to my, my HMO doctor who, who knows nothing. I research my posterior off, I do my own homework, and I say to myself, in the name of Jesus Christ, God gave me a will, and I'm not laying down and letting this man-made disease take me down. Do you understand what I'm saying? You have to have a will to fight and to survive, and you have to pray for God's healing. But third, you got to get off your, can I say butt? Okay, butt. You have to get off your butt and learn something. So I did research, and I was listening to a prominent biologist who's not a Christian, a female, brilliant woman. She was way over my head, but I, I was able to grasp the essential points. And she said that the seven primary global trigger diseases that cause immune system breakdowns and cause all the other diseases, she said, are coming primarily from the genetically modified food organisms. Because when they re-engineered the genetic code of these food organisms, remember this company, and I'm not naming them on purpose, used, they started out in the business of poisoning weeds. So they were a poison company first. And then they made a lot of money making poison, and then they went into genetically modified uh, food, which this is what they did. The first thing they did with their genetically modified food is they made it genetically resistant to any poison. So a farmer who wants to grow an organic, healthy crop with God-given seeds, the GMO companies spray the land between the two farming areas, and the GMO uh, 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 seeds and, and plants, they can withstand the poison. So the GMO crops flourish, and the organic crops, which haven't been meddled with, shrivel up and die because they're real, <clears throat> all right? Is that evil? That's God's seed, it's mm -hmm. evil, okay? But in the process of just doing that part of the genetic modification, just that part, and this is a multiplicity of parts, it that part creates a tr trigger effect that crashes immune systems and opens gateways for a wide spectrum of diseases. And that's why you see Americans sick everywhere you go. And they have all these diseases because they're eating GMO foods. You go to any big food retailer, okay, and 99% of those few foods are manufactured by the big seven food mm -hmm. giants. And let me tell you something, you read the ingredients, you're reading poison. Mm -hmm. So if you want to die early, keep eating your, you know, Cheerios or whatever. That's a disclaimer. I, I didn't really mean Cheerios. Okay. You understand what I'm saying? Now, You're not allowed to plug any okay. products. Yeah, I'm not allowed to plug any products, so forgive me for promoting the, the virtue of Cheerios. Okay. And then the con game is, okay, some of this food is literally cardboard, but they spray vitamins on it so the uneducated mother or father goes, oh, it's got all the essential vitamins. Okay, well, you're eating cardboard, fool. Okay, now look, here's the other part of it. To show you how evil these people are, they infiltrated the FDA. Yep. They control it. The FDA is useless. It's a prostitute, okay? It's, it permits poison. Now, here's the third and final thing. They created what is called the terminator seed, okay? The terminator seed, for those who are unaware of it, is they, they, re -gene uh, they genetically modified every seed they can get their hand on, basically, all right? Corn, soy, whatever, all right? And the, the point is the, terminates, the terminator seed is good for one crop only. Okay, so you can, you can plant your corn harvest or your avocados or your oranges or whatever the heck you know, you're growing, your wheat, whatever it is. One harvest, and then unlike God's seed, 
You can't gather the seeds and, and, and sow them into the earth and have endless harvests. Okay? They've, they change God's seed. Now, why do they do this? They do it for two reasons, economic and euthanasia, the de deliberate mass killing of the goal is billions of people on planet Earth. Because they go to all the third world nations where people are starving and farming, and they, have, they forced all these farmers across the world in poverty to buy their Terminator seeds. Gates has a vault up there in Iceland or something yeah. with all the original mm -hmm. seeds. And so what happens to these farmers is they plant their crop and then the, that season is over and they don't have enough money to buy another year's worth of Terminator seeds. So they starve to death and it's by intention and it's being done in nations that the elite think are inferior beings and the goal is to kill off billions of people through mass starvation this is being done right now through terminator seeds because they can't afford to buy them so if you're smart and you got home trees and whatever you better keep those seeds man they're going to be worth as much as gold one day now the FDA knows about this. The United Nations knows about this. Scientists know about this. Among the uh, scientific community, this is a well-known fact. Why do they allow it? Because it furthers their agenda. It accomplishes mass euthanasia in all these third world nations. But here's the sucker punch. It creates mass euthanasia in America. The diseases like Alzheimer's and dementia and this explosion of these new diseases is the setup, they're saying it already, the Obama language had it all, all over. You go to the hospital, you're elderly, you got this or that, and now they're giving you counseling. Hey, don't you think you should just end your own life? They want to kill off what they call the useless eaters. I've talked too long, but this is important. They messed with God's seed. Now, there are certain things in the Bible that are crossover lines with God. When the fallen angels mated with human women, right. that was horrendous. That's an abomination mm -hmm. before God. And he, he killed off the entire population of planet Earth, animals, fishes, human beings. The flood ju judgment was a targeted DNA judgment of hybrid corrupted DNA. You understand that? Okay. This messing with God's seed, which causes mass starvation of the poor. God hates that. And his judgment and wrath will be poured out upon the people who have done that. So when you read the book of Revelation, and you talk about how the mighty men and the kings of the earth fornicated with the harlot, Babylon. This is the, the fruit of fornicating with Babylon. You sell your soul to make billions of dollars yep. to make GMO terminator seeds, but God holds you responsible for the mass slaughter of the innocents. And believe me, they will experience the wrath of God. Yeah, amen. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> we are in a farming community and one thing that I find about the Bible is that it was written to me. And it's really fun to read the parts that point its finger at someone else. <laughs> yeah. Amen. But it is not so much fun to read the parts that point a finger at me. Amen. And as true truth seekers, farmers, my friends that farm, we need to look to find the truth and submit to the truth. That's my statement uh, yep. just one sentence in that and i apologize because i was not aware of the fact that that people uh, a sizable percentage of the community are in agricultural related businesses well, and farming because so i apologize to you because i i don't want to condemn anybody in agricultural mm -hmm. farming yep. it's a formidable challenge you're, yep. you're fighting against yep. a monster company yep. and if you're trying to grow uh, uh pure seed organic seed you're at war with very powerful people, and, mm -hmm. and you probably know their crops will eat up your crops. Mm -hmm. 
So I'm not heaping guilt on you and, 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 and blaming you for something. This, this is part of a bigger battle, so please don't think I'm accusing you and, and saying you're, you know, the wrath of God is going to be poured out about you. You're part of a bigger spiritual war. Yeah, and I say every one of us, especially farmers, needs to look at what Paul said and say, is it true? Right. That's what matters. Okay, next question. <laughs> Probably appropriate at this time. Why doesn't the deep state try to eliminate you since you are shaking their kingdom? Should we be cautious? And they checked uh, Chris, Paul, and Mike. <laughs> Why doesn't the deep state eliminate us? Well, um, I personally, I think it would just be too obvious to start going after people who, you know, who have radio shows and who make films and this kind of thing, because it would be. I, I had a conversation years ago with a guy named Jordan Maxwell. Does anybody know who Jordan Maxwell is? Yeah, yeah. Jordan Maxwell has studied all this conspiracy stuff for years. OK, and this is a story that he told me. And so I'll just give you this as sort of, you know, take it with take it for what it's worth. Uh, he told me, you know, he published all this research, all this information on what the government's doing, what the Illuminati are doing, all this other kind of stuff. And he said one day he got a phone call from somebody who worked at the FBI. And he wasn't sure if he could trust him. So he said, okay. He says, you work for the FBI. He says, all right, well, I'll tell you what. Do you have a phone number there at the FBI? Can I, I want to call the FBI and I want to ask for you and I want them to give me you. So he said, okay. So he gave me the information. So he hangs up with a guy then he calls the FBI office, right? He says, I want to talk to this guy. So they transfer him over. So he confirms that he's a real FBI agent. And the FBI agent said to him, he said, this is what I remember Jordan Maxwell telling me. He said, you know, Mr. Maxwell, we, we admire your research. There's a lot of stuff that you're, you're getting into that we find really very interesting uh, here at the FBI. But we want you to know we're not really after people like you. And the people who are in power are not really concerned about people like you. The people that we're concerned about are these militia groups that are stockpiling guns and ammunition and are talking about armed resistance to the government. And I'll never forget that conversation because then it was after that uh, that you had the whole issue with David Koresh and uh, the Waco, Texas episode and this kind of thing. And Koresh was into all sorts of a lot of this strange information and whatnot, but uh, he was part of this compound where they had all these guns and all this other kind of stuff. So it seemed to make sense. What they are primarily concerned about is people who I think, this is just my impression of it, uh, either, either have critical information against them that's where there's some kind of credibility. If you're like a former FBI agent or you're a former CIA guy, if you have the inside track, that's going to be one thing. Or people who they think are going to organize somehow or other some sort of armed resistance against them. That's why all of these militia groups, if you study them, sooner or later they're infiltrated by government agents and then they're overthrown from within. It's happened to one after another after another. So, uh, but if, if they went after people, you know, like Paul, uh, like myself and others who are making films and doing radio programs and this kind of thing, it would just fuel the, the conspiracy community. More and more people would become more suspicious and then the, it, would, it would backfire on them. It would work against them, I think. That's my general impression. I want to add to that, and I, 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 I would validate your general uh, impression. The other thing is the, that, that all three of us, and uh, you too, in a big way, even though your name wasn't mentioned, we have targets on our back from multiple uh, uh, enemies. But the thing is that you have to use wisdom, even in your boldness, and, and, and we're all bold different styles, but we're all bold, or we wouldn't be doing what we're doing. 
but you have to use wisdom on what information you're going to get out there. And so let me give you an example. If you, for some reason, had access to very sensitive secret information, let's say, during a presidential election, well, it's just a, one example, that if it went public, if you were to, to put it out there in the public, and that information was so dangerous to, to a political presidential candidate that it could potentially uh, crash their prospects for winning the presidency, or some other high powerful figure in the Federal Reserve or whatever, I mean specific concrete stuff that could bring somebody down who's very powerful and connected globally or whatever, you better watch yourself because you are an enemy, not necessarily to our government, but you're an enemy to people who are very powerful and can afford to hire private assassins, et cetera. So sometimes you just have to shut up and be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. Do you agree or not agree? I'd like to hear your opinion. Two things that um, come to me from the Word of God. Our biggest enemies are not flesh and blood. Amen. The powers that I worry about most Amen. are the unseen ones. Amen. They are principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. I have been withstood spiritually. Uh, generally, every time I go to Kenya, uh, there is a very big, fierce spiritual opposition uh, to, you know, to preaching God's word over there. Uh, sometimes I encounter that at home. And um, it's, it's hard to go through. And when you're done, you're licking your wounds and you're going, I hope to never do that again, mm. but then it'll come around again. So what, what I worry about most is not, um, and I've had death threats from people saying, you know, I hope somebody comes in, blows your church up, or I hope somebody you know, eliminate you or whatever. And so my wife and I and a lot of people in our church, we have concealed carry licenses and we are hoping to never ever go there. But the spiritual enemies and the spiritual opposition is the fiercest one and it's the one that troubles me the most. So if the devil could kill me, he would. But I'm not any different than you guys sitting there who believe the Bible you can pray just as loud and as long as I can, and the devil hates you, and if he would kill you, he would kill you, if God would allow him. The second thing is that we're just a small minority of people who believe the Bible and who say things that are in opposition to governmental powers. We say things that are opposition to companies like Monsanto and Cheerios and people like that. And we are, we are, we are gonna say what we're gonna say no matter what. And so the way to counter that from their part in the book of Ezra, these guys are gonna build the temple and they're gonna rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. That's when, when they came back from captivity, they said, we're not going to let this happen again. We're going to rebuild the house of God. We're going to rebuild the wall. Nobody's going to stop us. So here comes Zerubbabel, or they came to Zerubbabel, and they said, let us build with you, for we seek your God as you do. That's the ecumenical movement, Chris. Okay? That's everybody saying, we all worship the same God. Why don't you partner with us, and we'll help you build your church? And the answer was, Zerubbabel said, you have nothing to do with us to build a house unto our God. We'll build it. This is our work. We're not asking for your help. What they realized they wanted to do was get involved in it and shut it down from the inside. So then, they, here's what they did. This is in Ezra 4. Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building. And they hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. So... Yeah, I've got a video on YouTube that's got 10,000 views, okay? But who's getting the views on YouTube? Okay, clowns, comedy people, and people who are saying things and counseling people in ways that are opposition to the Bible, they're the ones being followed. You have the Hollywood elite that with practically every movie they make, 
Every TV show they write, every comic book that comes out, every novel, every story is in direct opposition to the things that we're saying from the Word of God. Those are the ones that are being followed. Those are the ones that are being believed. And so basically the way to shut us up is not kill us. It's just hire counselors to go out and spread lies and right. spread and tell people what they want to hear. Right. I'll never write a book as popular as Your Best Life Now. Okay? Wouldn't even plan on it. But here he is. This book is sold into the millions. He's as popular as Oprah Winfrey now. So you've got that convincing everybody how wrong we are. So they don't need to kill us. They'll just overwhelm us with things that are contrary to the Word of God. They'll try to destroy us by being louder than us or being more popular than us. I, I totally agree with my brother and, and a, a very important point, the spiritual battle first and the need to pray and commit yourself under God's protection in your family. But also what he said, the, 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 the more effective way and this is what Alice Huxley was saying when I was sharing. The more effective way, especially in the social media age, is to take people like us and... and, and belittle us. Belittle us, make us look like stooges and idiots and extremists and conspiracy theorists and nuts and kooks. And then people laugh at us. Mm -hmm. They don't need a bullet because you see what I'm saying? Uh, so that, that, that's, uh, that's real wisdom. But too, I also I also wanted to add to what uh, what Brother Mike said about how it doesn't just apply to people who are, you know, doing a radio show or whatever. Every believer, yeah. the Bible says, all that would live godly in Christ right. Jesus shall suffer persecution. Yeah. Right. I know people who don't necessarily have ministries, but they face all sorts of opposition in their families, yes. with friends, uh, at work. There's all kinds of circumstances out there. I mean, I think about in the book of Revelation where Jesus is talking to one of the churches and he says, the devil is going to cast some of you into yeah. prison so that you may be tried. Now, how is the devil going to do that? The devil's not going to appear somehow. He's going to work through people. He's yeah. right. the prince of the power of the air. He's going to take people captive. Just like in the book of Job, he stirs up the enemies of Job to go and attack him. Uh, there are enemies who are stirred up and they just go grab believers and persecute them. I think a lot of, pers it's why the understanding of the spiritual warfare is so important because we can be waylaid. I mean, that's really what, you know, as, as Mike says, that's the, the hardest part of all of this is when you're facing spiritual opposition and it leads you to confusion. Mm -hmm. And it, it's just like in Nehemiah, where you know you were talking about their hands are weakened so that they would not finish the work that's how the enemy works to try and discourage us to get us off the path to turn away from god i always think about in uh, you know when moses goes into egypt to draw out the children of israel and he proclaims their deliverance then pharaoh increases their burdens yeah pharaoh says okay now you're going to make bricks without straw makes things more difficult on them and in our family, um, most of us are, are believers in Christ, thank the Lord, but we've noticed this pattern over and over again. Whenever we try to, we say, okay, we're, we're gonna make a, a more godly effort to do this or to do that or whatever it is, then there'll be suddenly, right. we're all sort of scattered. Well, what happened? Well, this came up, that happened, right. mm -hmm. we're dealing with this, et cetera. And there's all of these distractions that come about. But I agree with, agree with Mike, the real opposition is spiritual, much more than anything else. Can I make a question? Sure. Um, I'm really enjoying being fed by my brothers. Um, I totally agree. And, and sometimes, uh, without seeing a demon every, under every dinner plate, but sometimes you, you see all this chaos in your life, you know, sickness, automobile accidents, all, all this weird stuff, all happening at once after you've made this like decision or commitment to do something for the Lord. And behind it, really, it's not circumstantial. It, it's demonic powers that you're battling and you, and you need to pray and put on the full armor of God. And then what was the other thing you said? I just had a mental blank before that. <coughs> <sighs> Well, it couldn't what have been. What did I say? I don't know. It couldn't have been. It was important. Can we rewind? Can we rewind no, I don't want to waste anybody's time. Okay, I'm going to get it. Obviously, it's, uh, you know, 
That's what happens when you have an hour of sleep. So. <laughs> so. Okay, for Jay, did the flood destroy the dinosaurs? And if so, why did Noah not have them on the ark? Okay. <clears throat> Good question. Perform a miracle and be relatively brief. Uh, the big picture here is always going back to our starting point. You know, what did God tell us about these things? And what Christians struggle with quite a bit is what God's word seems to say goes completely contrary to everything we, we think we know. Uh, most of what people think they know about dinosaurs isn't really anything they know. It's just what they've been taught over and over and over. Kindergarten on up. And kindergarten books always deal with dinosaurs. It's intriguing to children. So the first thing they learn is dinosaurs roamed the earth for millions of years, died out about 65 million years ago. And it's interesting. You see the pictures to think about some prehistoric time. So they get drawn into that. They go to school to learn about you know, dinosaurs. And they go to church to learn about Jesus. Back to school to learn about history. Back to church to learn about Jesus. Back to school to learn about math and you know, all science and all these things. The two don't seem to go together. So answering this question, you know, a lot of people will struggle with, but when we use God's word to build our understanding, everything else has to fit into that and won't go into all the science, but when we look at true science, it actually backs up what God's word is saying all along. It does say that God created everything in yeah. six days. Well, dinosaurs are part of everything. And God didn't say, I, God, created everything in six days except for those dinosaurs. I mean, come on, I couldn't have done that. Uh, if he would have said that, I would believe that. But he says he created everything in six days. It says he created the land creatures on day six. Dinosaurs are land creatures. They must have been created on day six. If people struggle with that, they don't have a problem with my philosophy. They have a problem with God's word because yeah. that's what it says. So dinosaurs are created on day six. It also says Adam and Eve were created on day six. They must have been together at the same time. Not because I was there and saw it. Not because I've reasoned through that. That's what God's word is teaching. When we look at the science behind that, there's a lot of evidence for that validity. So you get up roughly, just rounding it off, 1,700 years later, we have the account of the flood. God told Noah to take two of each kind of animal on the ark. doesn't say species, it says kind of animal. Dinosaurs were kinds of animals. There may have been, let's say, 75 major kinds of dinosaurs. Average size was pretty small, maybe the size of a sheep. Even the large ones, the T-Rex starts out pretty small. That's the largest dinosaur egg we've ever discovered. There's really no problem whatsoever when you really analyze this of Noah having two kind of, of each of the dinosaurs on the ark. The rest, everything that was outside of the ark that breathed air through its nostrils died. Mm -hmm. So all those dinosaurs are dying in the flood and all the other animals. 95% of the fossil record are marine invertebrates, sea creatures that don't have skeletons. That's because that's where they were living. They were living in the oceans when the flood came. They get buried first, so most of the fossil records. It's so very rare we find uh, creatures that are like mammals, whether it's bears or rats or people or dinosaurs. We very rarely find those things fossilized because they were more mobile when the floodwaters are coming. They end up drowning in the waters and their bodies completely decompose. Some of them got buried rapidly, you know, locally. Those can turn into fossils. So most of them die out in the flood, they're just gone. There would have been two of each kind on the ark and they would have survived after that. Coming off the ark, they would have survived for a while. Some probably didn't do quite as well in a changed environment after the flood. Some of them were probably hunted to extinction. But there's a lot of evidence of man interacting with these dinosaurs. Usually they use the word dragon because the word dinosaur wasn't invented until 1841 by a scientist who was a Christian, Richard Owen. So you don't find the word dinosaur in the King James. I don't find the word iPod in here either, other things. <laughs> um, but you do find the word dragon in Behemoth and Leviathan and Job 40, 40 and 41. So when we use the Bible to build our understanding of dinosaurs, we don't take dinosaurs and try to fit them in the Bible somehow. We use the Bible to properly understand that. And then when we look further at science, it actually confirms that. And I mentioned some of that yesterday with finding um, soft tissue and red blood cells and DNA still in dinosaur bones mm -hmm. and carbon-14, none of that should be there if they were 65 million years old, but it fits in well with them being buried in the flood roughly four and a half thousand years ago. I am blessed because as I hear you guys give answers, the other guys are nodding. You're of one mind. I don't think that's an accident. Interesting. Amen. Okay, this uh, uh, Question about once saved, always saved. Many times people will make an honest, heartfelt commitment when they're young, and then later on they think this is a big hoax. And then what do you think their eternal destiny is? 
So there's more to it than that, but that's the essence of it. And it's directed at Mike, so if Mike could start, and you could add to it. Mark chapter 4, and you can see it, Matthew 13. Um, when I studied this issue, I, I wanted to know God's truth and not what man said. Uh, Jacob Arminius is not an apostle. John Calvin was not an apostle. So whatever ideas these men came up with, they were not necessarily given to them by God. And they are oppositional to one another. So instead of me consulting a denomination or a denominational guide or commentary, I wanted to know from God what the answer to this was. Was I going to lose my salvation because of something that I did? Or now that I, I was saved when I was nine, can I go out and become, my favorite term is an atheist lesbian witch, and still go to heaven? Obviously, I'm not going to be a lesbian, but you get the idea. Um, and so I asked God, I studied every place in the Bible where the word salvation, saved, savior, every one of them. And I started taking those verses then, and I could see that they could fit in certain categories. Here's what God said about the Savior. Here's what he said about those that are saved. Here's what he said about, you know, how he saves them and for how long he saves them. And when you do that, then you start getting a clear picture of how God sees this issue and how God deals with it. And so in Mark chapter 4, we have the parable. And this is Jesus' doctrine. This is how he's, but he's teaching us. You, some of you guys are farmers, so you know this is how it works. Not every seed that you plant is going to do what you wanted it to do. And so he characterizes them uh, in four ways. He said, you know, there's some by the wayside. Okay, well, we all know people that we've tried to witness to. I have a friend, Tim Barons, who uh, lives in Lost Wages, Nevada, just so that he can stand on this bridge in Las Vegas and hand out 300 chick gospel tracks every single day and he knows that 99 percent of those tracks are going to go in the waste bin they're going to be looked at they're going to be people are going to go draw pictures in them or whatever but they're not going to listen to the word and so jesus said the sower soweth the word and these are they by the wayside where the word is sown but when they have heard satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts even if they read it Satan is going to take that away from them, and they're not going to believe it, and they're not going to be saved. Group two, these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution riseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended some issue in their in their mind that they will not let go i knew a man that we tried to witness to him for years he wouldn't come around finally a minister went out and talked to him and he received the word immediately with gladness three years later that same minister preached a sermon on genesis chapter one and god said he created it in six days six thousand years ago well this man was a high school science teacher and when he preached that sermon, he was furious, and he railed on that preacher. He said, how can you be so ignorant as to believe something like this? Well, you can't call God a liar. If you're going to believe John 3, 16, you've got to believe Genesis 1. That's how God puts it. And so he had no root, and he produced no fruit. Was he saved? If you're saved, it works, Okay. But he believed for a while, and then he decided he wasn't believing anymore. And if you read Hebrews 6, it matches exactly with this issue, because the next group of people is, these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. Who in here has got a thorn? Okay. The messenger of Satan is going to buffet you and punish you. We talked about that spiritual resistance we get. Okay. And with some people... It's going to be alcohol, it's going to be drugs, it's going to be adultery, pornography, it's going to be lying, it's going to be stealing, or whatever it is, 
And at some point, we know this for a fact because we now hear ministers who openly endorse uh, shacking up relationships, openly endorse sodomy. What happened to these people? More than likely, these guys have some of that in their life and they don't want to preach against it anymore because they want to keep doing it. And in that case, their sin, their thorn, chokes out the word of God in their heart and they don't believe it anymore. They get up and profess it, but they don't believe it. These also do not produce fruit. And fruit bearing is the sign of someone who is truly regenerate and truly born again. If you are saved, you are going to love God's word. You're not going to deny it. You're not going to despise it. You're not going to try to get around it. You're going to love the work of the Holy Spirit. You're going to love the chastening of God. Who in here has ever been on the receiving end of God's rod? If you, if you take that, Hebrews 12 says, if you take that, that's the sign that your father loves you. And he's going to keep you. And he's not chastising you because he's going to throw you into hell immediately. He's correcting you and he's correcting your behavior. That's how God deals with the sin problem of us Christians. He whoops the fire out of me and says, no, we're not going to do that again, are we? No, we're not going to do that again. <laughs> That's how it's supposed to work. And the Bible's term for those who will not accept that, you're a bastard. That's a curse word. And it means exactly what it says. You are not the recipient of God's inheritance. You're not his son. So that's the third group. Group number four. These are they which are sown on good ground. You farmers, what makes really good, rich soil? My daddy taught me the value of a compost pile. So every dinner scrap, everything that we cut off deer that we killed, all the rabbit guts, everything, grass clippings, they went into a pile and that rotted. And the worse it rotted, the worse it stank. And here's what God does. He finds the worst sinners that he can find. He finds the adulterers, the dope heads, the drunkards, the fornicators, the thieves, the murderers. He finds people like my brother-in-law who lived his life for Satan for all of his life until God finally got a hold of him and God saved him. And the last Sunday he was alive on this earth, he came to me just for assurance. He said, he said, Mike, he's my brother-in-law. He said, Augard, how can I know that I'm going to heaven when I die? And I said, Steve, you are. I can see it in you. And we prayed there in my office. And that Friday, he went home to be with Jesus. And his son said, Dad was different. Dad would be saying, I'd walk in his house. Dad would be sitting there reading his Bible. And you've got to know my brother-in-law. He didn't read Bibles. He didn't say amen to sermons. God changed him. And so the good ground is those of us that God finds the corrupt, nasty, dirty, filthy things in our life. And he says, that's where I can sow this seed at. And it brings forth fruit, some 30, some 60, some 100. It's not a contest. How many people we can reach, it's not a contest about how spiritual we can act. It's just that God brings forth the fruit in our life. And Jesus said, you shall know them by their fruits. No fruit, no salvation. So, to answer the question, it depends on the person and their belief. It's not about works. It's not about who does the most. Do you believe what God said? And do you believe everything that God said? That's how God packaged it. It's a take it or leave it. And there is always going to be a difference between those who believe and those who don't. And the fruit is going to be there. And that good ground people, they're saved. And they're saved and they're stuck with it and they don't despise it, and God's not sorry he saved them. That's my answer. I'm going to be very brief because my brother gave a very <clears throat> biblical, <clears throat> excellent answer. And so what I'd like to do, if I can clear my throat, <clears throat> I think your compo compost talk got to me. <laughs> um, like the fumes. Uh, okay, so this is just a commentary. 
uh, just my human commentary, not that anything I say personally is nothing more than a human commentary. You know, I've, I've observed and in, been involved in these theological debates for years, especially like Cal, uh, Calvinist the, theology or Arminian theology, uh, where you know you're part of God's elect, uh, or you can lose your salvation. And I think that some of the answers uh, come from two two ways. And, and, that, and the first, the Word of God, and, uh, is, is the primary way. But in terms of observation. Um, when we understand or reflect upon the fact that God lives outside of the dimension of space and time and he knows the, the, the beginning from the end, yeah. he knows who is going to be saved. Yes. Okay? He does. Okay? He, 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 so he, he makes the effort to save every man and every woman, mm -hmm. but he knows ahead of time who's going to be saved. Exactly. We don't, and we should never judge, you know. Yeah. Okay. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's the perspective of, of your dimension answers a lot of, qu of these questions. And I think some of the arguments between Arminial, Arminian theology and Calvinist theology uh, are answered through this dimensional perspective. Now, the other thing is this. Uh, th this is how I see it. This is my commentary. When you're born again, when you're truly born again, right. you cannot be unborn again. So when my brother was, was uh, teaching the word here about the, the heart and the stony ground, et cetera, et cetera, and whether the seed takes root, for, just to quickly summarize it, it takes root when you're truly born again. Right. There are a lot of people who pray the prayers of salvation, whatever, but they were never truly born again. Because if you're truly born again, the Spirit of God, Jesus, takes up residence inside you and he regenerates your inner man with the Holy Spirit right. and you become, through the resurrection power of Jesus Christ, a brand new creature in Christ. It's a done deal. It can't be undone. Okay? You are guaranteed entrance into heaven. Now here's the problem. We see lots of Christians who, 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 who claim to be born-again Christians, who, 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 who we saw get saved, who became born again. But we see them get into spiritual error or apostasy or, or, or unrepented sin for their whole lives, and it doesn't seem to bother them. You know? They can commit sins, and there's no evidence of, of the Spirit of God in their lives. So we make the assumption, based on our human perception, that they've lost their salvation. Okay, like why are these two people living uh, together outside of marriage for like 40 years? Yeah. Why, why they, they don't feel the conviction? Okay, they must not be born again or they lost their salvation. I would suggest to you that's the, the, the incorrect conclusion. The correct conclusion, in my opinion, based on the, on the Word of God, is that you cannot lose your salvation. Otherwise, it's not the good news of Jesus Christ. You're always walking on eggs and, and the dependency of your salvation is your good works. Dennis Dake taught in repeated regeneration. Mm -hmm. You're saved, you sin once, you've lost it, you must repent to get it back. Now you have it back, but if you sin again, you are lost again and you must be saved again. And that's ridiculous. Yeah, absolutely. Ridiculous. But there's a growing number of people that are right. believing there that. Is, there is, can, can I jump in here? For, no, just please let All me right, go ahead, go okay. ahead. I'm sorry. I'm, <laughs> okay, so the correct perception and observation is this. People don't lose their salvation. You can't lose your salvation. Otherwise, the good news of Jesus is the bad news. Because you could lose your salvation at any moment. How can you have joy in that? The real question is, and the real answer is, that the, the people in the situations we can't seem to process because they, they sin, they don't feel guilty, et cetera, or their behavior, it, it comes down to this, what bro my brother was teaching. They were never truly born again to begin with. They were never truly saved to begin with. The Spirit of God did not regenerate them in their inner man. Okay? They were never really born again. They, 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 they acted, behaved like they were born again, but they were never truly born again. Because if they were truly born again, you can't continue to sin without the conviction of the Holy right. Spirit.
And that's my answer and odd to my brother. Well, just to support everything that Paul is saying and that Brother Mike is saying and so on, I mean, it's interesting. When the question was first asked, I started to open my Bible to Mark chapter 4, and then Brother Mike said, you go to Mark chapter 4, uh, because this is something I believe the Lord showed me years ago, uh, where it says, I mean, just to affirm what, what Paul is saying, th this is what the Word of God says. Uh, it says there are those on the stony ground, and they immediately they receive it with gladness, right? But it says, and have not root in themselves. They yeah. have no root in themselves. Who is the root? Right. Jesus. Yeah. Jesus says, I am the root and the offspring of yeah. David. Jesus is called the root of Jesse in the Old Testament. That's good. Okay, so Jesus himself, he is the root. So when Paul says, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Paul had the root in himself. He had the root who is Christ himself. That is the regeneration. That's the spirit of God. Now, years ago, uh, I was in with a collection of people who believe in conditional security. That's what this is called. Conditional meaning that you can lose your salvation. And they would say to me, they would say, well, so you believe once saved, always saved. And I, my response over time, once I studied this thing was no, if saved, always saved. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Not yeah. once saved, always saved, because the Bible doesn't say that. What I would usually do is I would say, you know, I don't like to use these catchphrases because they're not biblical. Right. I like to go to what the Word of God says. Jesus says, all those that the Father giveth me shall come to me. Yeah. And he that comes to me, I will in no way cast out. The Bible says, he that began a good work in you shall see it through yeah. to the day of Jesus Christ. For it is God that worketh in you to will and to do of his Amen. good pleasure. Now, what the conditional security teachers argue, they argue, they'll go to the Old Testament and they'll go to the story of Saul, King Saul, and how the Spirit of God came upon King Saul. And then when King Saul sinned against God, the Spirit of the Lord removed itself from Saul. Mm -hmm. And they'll argue, well, see, that's, that's a picture, they say, that you can lose your salvation, that even though you receive the Spirit, you can lose the spirit. But what they, what I believe the Lord showed me when I was in the middle of all this, I was praying about it, and I came upon 2 Samuel chapter 7, mm -hmm. God's promise to David. Yeah. Okay, yeah. what does he say to David? He says, because uh, David wanted to build the temple, God says, no, you're not going to build the temple. Your son, who's going to be born of you, he's going to build the temple. And this is really a picture of Christ who builds the spiritual temple of the church also a picture of Solomon. And he says, uh, I'm gonna be his father, he will be my son. If he commits iniquity, then I will chasten him with the rod of men Amen. after the sons of the children of men, but my mercy, mercy will Amen. not depart from him as I took it from Saul yep. who was before thee. Mm. So God's promise, his specific promise to David and the offspring of David Remember, Jesus says, I am the root and the offspring of David. Hmm. His promise is, my mercy will not depart hmm. as I took it from Saul. That was, that was like a big issue. I remember my wife and I sitting there trying to yeah. hash through this. And then I came upon that promise and I said to her, honey, God says specifically he's not going to do that. Because this is the sure mercies of David. Psalm 89 is a double witness to that. Uh, go ahead. I just Amen. Want to throw that well, in. well that, that's what I wanted to say. We, we have the reassurance. This is where, uh, I, I mean, you know, the Bible says the Lord knows them that are his. Yeah. In John, uh, Jesus says, he says, but there are some of you that believe not. And then it says, for Jesus knew from the beginning those that believe not and who should betray him. Okay, some people try to say that Judas was saved mm -mm. and that he lost his salvation because Jesus says, have I not chosen you 12? Mm -hmm. They say, see, Judas was chosen. And I say, wait a minute. It says, have I not chosen you 12? And one of you is a devil. Yeah. And I said to somebody, are devils saved? And they're like, no. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, good. Yeah, they're not saved, are they? Uh, so you can't say Judas was saved and then he lost his salvation later on. Jesus doesn't say, have I not chosen you 12? And one of you is currently saved, but you're going to become a devil later on. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say that. He says one of you is a devil. Currently, Judas, I believe, was never saved. 
He was always a betrayer. He was always a devil. And that's what the Lord says of him. Also, uh, Jesus warns when he says that on the last day, many are going to say to him, mm -hmm. Lord, Lord, uh, did we not uh, in your name yeah. cast out devils? And have we not in your name done many wonderful works? And then Jesus says to them, depart from me, uh, ye that work iniquity, I never, I never knew, knew you. you. Yeah. He doesn't say, I used to know you, you used to be saved, but then I changed my mind. That's not what he says. He says, I never knew you. That there was never that relationship there. They never had that root in themselves. They were never saved. They were never new creatures in Christ. Everything that uh, my brothers are saying over here. So. <clears throat> Now I feel, I, I feel your pain because I have to ask if I can do one more question. <laughs> Who do I ask? Who's the authority here? <laughs> I got the mic, so maybe I am. We can refuse if you... <laughs> okay. <laughs> Five minutes. Okay, we got to make it quick. All right. But I don't know who Mark Taylor is. Does anybody know who Mark Taylor is? He's supposed to be a prophet, and he made, he made a prophecy about Trump and the USA. You know, somebody, somebody mentioned it to me. I can, I can comment generally, but not specifically, mm -hmm. which is an oxymoron. <laughs> you don't want to comment? No, I will, but, but, but I, I need to preface it that I'm not aware of this, the, all the specific content. And so it's not, uh, it's not, I'm not going to make a negative or I'm not going to judge it. I'm just going to give a, a basic framework for dealing with anything that, uh, where somebody claims it, to have a prophecy, okay, regarding anything. And you, you were talking about the, this morning. Mm -hmm. um, that we're, we're supposed to discern the spirits and we're supposed to judge prophecy, okay? And obviously the word of God is our final authority. And this is the observation which hopefully has tr a teaching truth in it. Over the years of my walk with Jesus Christ, I have seen uh, numerous books that contain prophecies about various presidents and what would happen. Now, I'm not trying to plug my book, Trumpocalypse, but it sounds like I'm pr promoting it. I'm not, I'm using it as an illustration. I deliberately say in the book, I, I, I do not call myself a prophet, okay, like Joel or Isaiah or whatever. I deal with prophetic teaching. There's a big difference, okay? And this book is not a prophecy of thus saith the Lord of what's going to happen. It's, it's an analysis, hopefully from a biblical worldview, okay? There's a difference between that and if I wrote a book giving you a whole uh, uh, saying this is going to happen through Trump, okay? Because I've seen so many prophets write these books. I'll give you a classic example. All these prophets came forward when Bill Clinton was about ready to be elected. Mm -hmm. Major respected evangelical and charismatic leaders met with Bill Clinton in the White House, and I know these, some of these men, and they said that they looked him in the eye and they knew the Holy Spirit was in them and that he was born again. By a man that, 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 that is one of the most respected and sound Bible teachers in America. And then there were these prophets who said that he's going to, uh, uh, Clinton is going to have a repentance, he's going to have an encounter with God and there's going to be a great revival in America through Bill Clinton. I heard similar <laughs> books of prophecy on Obama and others. Yeah. So I don't know the contents of Mark Taylor's book, okay? But if he's claiming to be, to, to, to be giving you a prophetic message, which is essentially saying the Lord is speaking through him, beware. Because all these books I read on the, did that thing happen with Bill Clinton? No. No. And not only that, it was the work of the devil through the false prophets. Yeah. Because what it did in the real world is it compromised the church. It neutered the church from being on their guard spiritually and the evangelical church being on their guard, being sober and vigilant. And that put them in 
to, because they accepted the false prophecy, it put them in the mode of thinking, oh, God's going to do a miracle through this man's heart and we're going to have a great revival so we can go to sleep and not participate as, as Christ commands us to in our, our, in our government. It neutralized the church. The false prophecy neutralized the church because he never repented, right? Did revival ever come through him? Did, did, did Obama have an experience with Jesus? Has revival come through Obama? No. So beware of false prophets. Beware. And that is said throughout the New Testament. Yeah. I'm going to add just a little bit and close it. And I think I can speak for the panel and for us, the, the committee. Okay, <clears throat> first of all, it was a lot of information, and you're going to forget half of it, if not more, by the time you get to your car. I'd recommend getting the DVDs and then review it. If you consider this valuable, mm -hmm. get the DVDs, and there's YouTube available. Review it, review it, review it. But more than that, read and review the Bible and ponder it and meditate on it and read it again and again. Okay, and that it's it's called the renewal. In Romans, it says to renew our minds, be yeah. not conformed, but renew our minds. Uh, no, be transformed by the renewing of, by the renewing <clears throat> of your mind, yeah. not your heart, because when you renew your mind, then your heart can be renewed. OK, um, so hope hopefully that was good. But uh, here's what I want to read. Jeremiah chapter 17. Verse 5 and verse 7. This is in regards to Donald Trump now, from, from, from me. <clears throat> Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, Amen. and maketh flesh his arm, yeah. and whose heart departeth from the Lord. Verse 7. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, whose hope whose hope the Lord is. Okay? That's what I say about it. Can I get agreement from you Amen. guys? Amen. Amen. So anyway, hey, th folks, thanks a million. And uh, hopefully we'll see you here again. We'll see a lot of you as time goes on. And uh, I really feel that I'm in the presence of the Holy Spirit because I know that almost unanimous i i hope you never know but you are believers amen. and so you have the holy spirit in you so we are in the fellowship of the holy spirit amen and thanks to you guys for being here and uh your dedication to prepare and deliver the best that you can and thanks to the committee um i they've cut my throat so i can't invite them i usually like to get them up here so you can see who these guys are but uh Thanks to you guys for all the work that you do and your faithfulness. And uh, so we'll close. Paul? Just very quickly. I feel prompted by the Holy Spirit uh, that somebody in authenticated spiritual leadership, maybe one of the brothers here or uh, an authentic minister that's, okay, uh, that the speakers are prayed for God's supernatural protection over each speaker and their family. I just felt prompted to pray for that, okay, by the Lord, okay? And it's really important because we are on the front lines, okay? But, and so we need that prayer covering, okay? And then, but we also want to cover all of you, too, because you are in the spiritual battle that we're in. Okay, so I, I will uh, honor the, 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 the your uh, tossing the uh, commitment to lead in prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, we praise you, Lord. We thank you that you're King of kings and Lord of lords, and that the name of Jesus Christ is above every name in, on, in heaven and in earth, and that you are the supreme authority. You are the supreme being, and that your throne is above every earthly throne or uh, counterfeit demonic thrones. And Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we 
now come before you through the blood of the Lamb. We appropriate the blood of Jesus Christ and ask that our sins and the sins of the people and sins in our family, that we be cleansed by the blood of Jesus right now and those lives streaming. And we receive, Father, your righteousness by faith. And we come boldly to the throne of grace right now, God, to find an ever-present help in time of need. And so, Father, we're asking you, we're asking you right now to release your supernatural protective power to cover every minister, speaker, family represented here, especially the speakers who ministered, the, the Red River Prophecy Team and their families, and all the people in the families who have attended or who have participated through live streaming. We ask for your supernatural protection, Father, and we ask that we would dwell under the secret place of the Most High and under the shadow of the Almighty. And Father, in Jesus' name, we agree with you as you bind every principality and power and you render every operation of darkness inoperative. You destroy the works of darkness, Father, and you release, Father. We ask you, Jesus, to, to release your angelic armies, your, your highest ranking angelic armies per your decision, per your, per your assignment, release your angelic armies to act like a supernatural kingdom of God, secret service or special ops to protect your servants, your ministers, your people and their families. And we commit all of this to you, Father, praising you that we are protected and walk under the authority of Jesus Christ and every knee and every mouth shall confess and every knee shall bow and confess, I messed it up, I apologize, Lord, that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. 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 Hopefully, hopefully we will see you in heaven soon. Amen. <laughs> if not, Hopefully we'll see you next year. <laughs>